Welcome back to The Narrative On. With me is uh, former president of the Senate in Grenada, Chester Humphrey, uh, taking a look at uh, events uh, in the region and uh, focusing now on uh, what's something that happened here in the parliament in Grenada. Uh, the opposition leader, Dr. Keith Mitchell, walking out after the Speaker of the House suspended his uh, presentation on a supplementary budget that was being passed in the House uh, recently. Welcome back to the program. So we all saw, I mean, the one, one of the most talked about things um, is the, the walkout of uh, Dr. Mitchell. He actually was, it didn't seem as if he was thrown out, that he chose to leave, that all that happened was that his presentation was suspended. Uh, walk me through, could this have been avoided? Was this uh, orchestrated? Was this, what, what's your opinion on that, what happened in, 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 the, up, in the lower house? Well, what happened in the lower house, um, we first have, in my view, the genesis of the problem. And the genesis of the problem in the lower house, because I want to contrast that to the, um, the Senate. In the Senate, we have Dr. Decima Williams um, as the presiding officer. And... Um, from, from the time the Houses of Parliament was convened for the new sitting, for the new session of Parliament, um, we have not had such any kind of atmospheric contention, so to speak, in the House of Senate. It has been orderly. In fact, it has maintained the traditions that, um, it, it, that immediately following my... Um, um, my demitting office, it has maintained that tradition. It has been, its affairs have been conducted orderly. Its debates have been quite robust, but, um, but within the context of the acceptable standards of the quorum in the House. So it is not to say that maintaining the decorum of the House is an impossibility. I, I, I make reference to the Senate and I make reference to Dr. Williams, um, um, uh, the Honorable Decima Williams, to contrast that with the, the with the Speaker in the House of Representatives. Now, when you look at how the House of Representatives is um, its business is conducted, you would recognize immediately that. The primary problem there is the lack of knowledge of these standing orders or the rules of the House. The current speaker, Speaker Cato, um, has not spent enough time studying these rules, understanding these rules, memorizing these rules, as well as informing himself of the procedures in the House. And there's abundant evidence of that. Um, what is worse is the speaker is misinformed and, in my opinion, confused. B before I, I go further, let me say it is not my style. I have never criticized the speaker before. Um, this is two years plus running now that he's the presiding officer. Um, but I've made my own observations, and I've kept them pretty private. I've spoken to one or two individuals, hoping that they in turn will be able to at least reach the speaker. Um, last year, towards the latter of the year, there was for the first time a parliamentary seminar sponsored by the Commonwealth Association. And to that training seminar, was invited all members of both houses. Uh, I was one of the resource persons together with um, former clerk of parliament, um, Abel Newton, and we did deliver on matters of procedure, on matters of the rules, on matters of the traditions of parliament and so on. To what extent that has helped the speaker is doubtful from what I observe. But the basic problem here is, is that the speaker um, uh, sees himself as an activist combatant um, and, and he, with his sole purpose 
or with, with the sole objective of reining in um, what I would describe as the NNP side of the house. And in particular, he has some unsettled scores, it would appear, um, with Dr. Mitchell. And he sees his task as reining in Dr. Mitchell. And because he lacks knowledge of the rules, he replaces a lack of knowledge of those rules with what is now manifestly obvious to all, bullyism. So oftentimes he would use the power of the chair and the power of the chair is fairly wide um, um, to establish that he is king of the roost and that when he speaks, no one barks. The tonal quality of the speaker leaves much to be desired. It's unpolished, it's rough, it's sort of brawlish. It's almost like if he is in a, a, a fish marketplace, um, his demeanor uh, does not accord with um, the, the regality of the office of the speaker. And you can see that. You can see how people like Sir Kurt um, carry themselves, Georgie Maguire. You can see how Joan Purcell, uh, I'm not mentioning myself here, Dr. John Watts, and others, a whole array of presiding officers, you would see how they conducted themselves, right? This speaker, as I said to you, um, conducts himself um, as though he was presiding over a tebe in the marketplace. As I said, his body composure, his language, his tonal quality um, is unpolished and rough. And especially when um, he has to engage with Dr. Mitchell, who we must understand is the longest serving prime minister in this country, no matter what he may think of Dr. Mitchell's um, 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 politics or Dr. Mitchell's attitude. And that is not to say that Dr. Mitchell himself may not have invited all right, um, um, some of what the speaker <laughs> may do. Um, because one has to sort of measure the field. You know, one has to, and Dr. Mitchell is a cricketer, so he must survey the field, see the placement of the field, and read the ball as it comes out the hand of the bowler so that he can position himself to play the ball in the best traditions of an expert cricketer. And, I mean, um, without wanting to make a sweeping conclusion, I would say those of us who are sitting in the grandstand looking at the match do not believe that we've seen the finest cricket from Dr. Mitchell. He seems no, no. to play blindly to the ball. So I'm being figurative here. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, I, get I want to keep the focus on what is happening in the house because you see, um, what happens but, but, in the but, but, house? But one, of the things, but, but one of the things that I wanted to ask you here is, had the speaker been aware, as aware of the rules as he needs to be, had the speaker possess the right carriage for the, the chair that he sits, uh, sits in. Well, how, how, some... how, was, how was this supposed to play out? Dr. Mitchell says that uh, MP for Karaku needs to apologize because he made disparaging comments about public officers, uh, about teachers, and he needs to apologize. The MP for Karaku stands up and says, Mr. Speaker, I did not say what I said. The Speaker calls on the opposition leader to show... I mean, you know, what, why he's saying what he's saying? Because the, the, the MP for Karaku says, I didn't say this. Dr. Mitchell says, well, it's out there. Everybody has seen it. The speaker asks, um, well, can you provide the evidence? Dr. Mitchell says, well, the evidence can be had. It can be had, but, you know, I don't have it now, is what he seemed to be saying. And he asks him to withdraw it. Countless times, of course, we saw Dr. Mitchell saying, you know, do I want? Um, well, throw I, me out if you I, want. But how was that supposed to play out if it had been done the right way? All right, well, let me tell, let me tell you, if, if, if the speaker was an informed speaker, and if the speaker was consulted with his clerk, which all speakers do all over the world, um, this is what would have happened. To my mind and to my knowledge, the Honorable Tevin Andrews properly stood on a point of order. Let's be clear on that. Mm -hmm. When he stood, the point of order was that there was a claim 
that he made certain statements. The first breach of the rule is you can't engage in reported speech in the House unless that reported speech was a speech made in the House on a prior occasion, wasn't challenged or anything, or if it was a reported speech from an official document. You can't come to the House to say, well, um, Mary or Tanti Emma near the market say this, and it was heard by John Doe, and John Doe repeated it, so I am bringing it to the house because everybody knew it. That, that, that's but, really but, 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 it, but, it, but in the case it, of the, the information that Dr. Mitchell was talking about was second, contained in a second. video presented by the MP for Caracol. One, one second, one second, one second. This, this, the, speaker, the speaker then said, speaker then said, but do you have the evidence? Dr. Mitchell said, yes, I have the evidence. The evidence is all over the place. I can bring the evidence. Now, what the speaker done, because up to this point, the speaker had not revealed whether or not he was aware of any existing evidence. If he was, then he would have said, based on the evidence that I have, one, two, three, four. So from all that the speaker indicated and all that the speaker revealed, he was asking for the evidence to be provided. No, there's a basic rule. He who asserts must prove. Dr. Mitchell said he asserted that he has the evidence and the evidence will show that Tevin Andrews did say that teachers can repair their homes and they have money in the bank and they, 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 wait, they, they don't want to do that. They're waiting on government to expect government to prepare their homes for them right now. When Mr. Andrews stood up, he said that this information was false. He never made those statements. And so therefore the House has been misinformed. And that's a proper, that's a proper um, um, point, point of order upon which to stand because you cannot misinform the House. And of course, if you misinform the House intentionally, it's a more serious, it's a more serious matter. So when the speaker inquired as to whether or not the evidence was available, that inquiry indicated that the speaker himself did not know whether or not um, um, the Honorable Tevin Andrews' point of order was well-founded or the response of Dr. Mitchell's was well-founded. So a mature, uh, um, an objective speaker would simply have said, well, um, I cannot give a ruling because I don't have the evidence. It's not possible to request the evidence from you right now unless we suspend the entire parliament and send you to go and get it. That is not a feasible option. So what we will do is to suspend discussion on the issue. And the speaker suspends further discussions on the issue. He instructs the clerk to put a stay on this matter in the Hansard. And he would advise parties, including Dr. Mitchell, who is the one who asserted what he was saying, and he, he's the one who's responsible for the statement, he would have directed Dr. Mitchell, um, please, I'm suspending further discussion on this matter because I know not the truth or otherwise. I know not the facts or otherwise. I have two claims. Each can be valid. Of course, each can be, each can be valid at, at, at the same degree. It is that one claim is valid and another not or the other is valid and the other um, is not. So the speaker then says, I suspend this debate on this issue and give you time to present the evidence. Meanwhile, because the matter is suspended, you cannot, throughout this debate, make any reference to that matter again. You can't repeat it because there's an objection to what you have said before me and I'm not able to give a ruling. Speaker didn't do that. The speaker manifests his bias again in that he gave the benefit of the doubt to Tevin Andrews, showing partisanship. Again, this is a fundamental departure from the principles upon which the presiding officer operates universally. A presiding officer, while he may come from one party, while he may serve at the pleasure of the prime minister in the house, once he adopts the title of speaker, then he has to be neutral and he must be fair. And fairness and neutrality 
must be manifest and visible. So fairness and neutrality in the context of the incident of which we are now discussing would have demanded that the speaker could not have given the benefit of the doubt because there was no evidence before him and he revealed that he had no evidence before him. So the question then arises, the only how he could make this decision in favor of, of the Honorable Tevin Andrews is on the basis of manifest bias. Now, once you descend into bias and unfairness, then you create an environment for serious contention because you, in a sense, undermine the respect that the chair um, induces. And I can tell you, I have never, and I mean, people know me, I'm a, I'm, I'm a fierce, independent thinker. I, 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 I am in, in, the, in the parlance of the young people, I'm a wicked debater, right? <laughs> um, but in, in, during my sojourn in the house, I have had enormous respect from all sides of the house because I have been fair. I have disciplined members on the, N N N on, on the NNP party side of which I am a member, and I have disciplined members on the opposition side. I have had to deal with the contentions of a Senator Gawi um, in his conflicts with Senator Burke at the moment. Uh, likewise, um, 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 Senator, um, what's her name? Um, her name is going to come to me for uh, in a while. Right? So I have been fair and I have been objective. I have never had, the Senate under me has never deteriorated into what you see happened there on Tuesday last week. Neither has the Senate so far under the, under the, the leadership and guidance of the Honorable Decima Williams. She has not had that problem. So it is not a problem of the structure, but is a problem of the personality that occupies that structure. I mean, no, I take I, Senator Cox. Senator Cox is a leader of government's business. I'm sorry, the leader of the opposition business in the House. And quite often, when he presides and he interviews, so Dr. Williams, Dr. Williams compliments him because he's quite knowledgeable. And I, I will take one for myself as the American, say, of course, he was schooled under me during my time as a presiding <laughs> officer. So he knows. He has, he has some knowledge no. of the rules. But a uh. fundamental problem here is lack of the rules. And let me just spend a little moment, if you will. Oh, maybe I'm speaking too much and I should let you. But <laughs> um, it's and, the lack and, of no, knowledge no. of the rules. And, and this has emerged time and time again. Mm. At the commencement of the last sitting, from the very beginning, the speaker sailed that canoe into an eddy. He, from the beginning, he started by indicating that there were no rules governing debate on a supplemental budget. And nothing is falling is that, from the is, truth. Is, but is that so? That, seem, that does not ring a bell. That seems a little odd to me. No, I said, and this is early in the game, just after the prayers and different things. Once we got to, well, we had questions, and after questions, we got to, we got to remember the motion now, mm -hmm. right? We got to the motion. Um, dealing with the supplemental income of revenue and expenditure. Um, the speaker starts off by asserting erroneously that there are no rules. And therefore, the standard rule of 15 minutes, he wants to increase that by giving an additional 15 minutes. And then the speaker engaged in the most quaint and strange conduct that I've ever seen. The speaker now introduces a motion in the house. <laughs> Strange. Never heard of it. Introduces a motion. Uh, now, when he did that, in order to give everybody 15 minutes more, <laughs> because the speaker doesn't know the rule, standing order 40 on page 30 of the House of Representatives of Grenada, right, lays out the following and i read to you in full um, um standing order 40 clause one and i quote on the presentation of and debate on the annual estimates of revenue and expenditure in brackets the budget 
in the House, the following rules shall apply. The Minister of Finance, in presenting the said estimates in his budget speech, may speak as long as he wishes. Two, the Leader of the Opposition or any other member of the Opposition designated by the Leader of the Opposition replying to the Minister of Finance may speak as long as the Minister of Finance spoke under paragraph one of this paragraph or for two hours, whichever is greater. Three, the Prime Minister, if different from the Minister of Finance, may speak as long as the Minister of Finance spoke under paragraph one of this paragraph or for two hours, whichever is greater. All other members, including ministers, may speak for one hour. No, the Prime Minister is the first among equals. So although he's not the Minister of Finance, and if he is not the Minister of Finance, he is treated with a special privilege. So that in effect, the standing orders makes no distinction between the budget and a supplement. They are all budgets. And it is the Honorable Deacon Mitchell, and I'll come back to that in a moment, how titles, the, the significance of titles and how they are used. Um, let me just deal with it right away. So it is not, when Dr. Mitchell, for example, was a professor of mathematics at, I think, it's American University or it was Howard, wherever he had a professorship. Um, his doctorate, he was not referred to as Dr. Mathematics. He was not referred to as Dr. Professor. He is referred to as Dr. Mitchell. In other words, the title belongs to the person. So the title of Honorable does not belong to the office of the person. It belongs to the person and not the office. So it is incorrect to say the Honorable Prime Minister. And this is two years plus that this presiding officer is presiding in the house. And the presiding officer consistently says, the Honorable Prime Minister, the Honorable Minister of Works. There is no such designation. The designation is simply a designation to the person. So the proper use of the title is the Honorable Deacon Mitchell Prime Minister. It is not the Honorable Prime Minister. And the speaker keeps saying that over and over and over again. Again, but, hope, but hopefully, knowledge. hopefully, so hopefully, I'm hopefully, hopefully again. somebody would. Be, but, but we do. I again. did. I do. I, I do want to be able to touch finish. on on the point. change of yeah, rules within the NNP as well, and we are quickly running yeah, out of time let, here. Let me so just, let me just, all right. But so let me just change that. When, in fact, it was the government side that corrected the speaker, Mr. So Speaker, Rule Forty. It was the government side, not the opposition side, that said to the speaker, well, we should follow rule 40. Because Dr. Mitchell said, well, you've never heard this before. In any event, when, when the government side corrected the speaker and they moved now, the speaker did a rather strange thing. Again, lack of knowledge of the rules. The speaker called for a vote on the rules when the, there's no need to vote on the rules these are the rules here these are the rules here right so so there, so, so, no, so, so it's almost no... so it's almost as if he's, he's making it up as he goes along um right something. and worse and worse when the rules when when the, when 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 the vote is now taken dr mitchell calls for a division and the speaker refuses to accede to that call and when Dr. Mitchell was insistent and stood up and said, well, Speaker, I call for a division. The Speaker said, well, for a division of the wrong time. And they have to order, literally. When the, the, the time when you call for a division is after the Speaker would have said, because in canvassing the votes, the voice votes, the Speaker, when the question is put, the Speaker says, those in favor of the money, Say I. People say I. Those against, nay. People say nay. Then the speaker says, I think, I think the eyes have it. And the speaker pauses. The speaker pauses so that the house can indicate 
whether or not it's in concurrence with the speaker. If nobody says anything, then the speaker doesn't say what he thinks. He says, he says, the eyes have it. The eyes have it or the nose have it. Now, when he pauses, someone may stand and say, well, look, I want a division. It's at that stage that a member of the House calls for a division. So that the call for a division simply means we do not want a collective voice vote. What we want is an individual voice vote registered in the hand side. But because the speaker doesn't know the rules, he denies Dr. Mitchell. And again, there is it, we have it. it. What is the danger of, because I've, also, I've, I've observed, and um, what is the danger, or the, is there any danger in having a speaker who is either unaware of the rules or disregards the rules in favor of bias and also has what comes across as what appears to be a strong bias as well in conduct of the house is there a danger involved in that or well you know the bills get passed anyhow well, there is the a debate danger happening. because what happened what happened then is that you saw the atmosphere discord you know people then people then believe that you are unfair that there's no justice here and then contentious take, contention takes its place right and remember the first duty of the speaker is to maintain the decorum of the house to make sure that the proceedings of the house go smoothly hmm. that laws are passed and that other measures for the good governance of the state now you can't do this if you are manifestly unfair i mean i've seen the speaker do some incredible things on one occasion the prime minister did not have the floor and he stood up on a point of order on a matter he was not involved in and the speaker allowed him so this, the prime minister did not have courage of the matter he was not on the floor on the matter yet he stood up on a point of order objecting to a debate which had already gone i mean the strangest things are happening with this gentleman doesn't know the rules and, and so much so that when the Prime Minister got up to speak on Tuesday, his first contribution was to tell the speaker what the dictionary explanation of, 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 of supplemental, the word supplemental was. Because the only person in the entire House of Representatives who did not understand the word supplemental and therefore felt that that word took the, 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 the debate outside of rule 40 was a speaker so the, 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 the honorable deacon mitchell was trying to explain to the speaker a speaker i mean and this is my interpretation of that intervention because the intervention came after that fracas was passed but so essentially what he's telling the speaker i mean speaker buck up yourself these are the rules and if and, you don't and, understand and, what the word and, and, if you don't this, understand this, this what it means their man. Is, i'll speak to you about it this this is their man, so you know he can. Yes, so he's he's even embarrassing the government, and this has happened before. It's not the first time that Prime Minister Deacon Mitchell has had to stand in the house and take umbrage to the speaker. Well, he's doing it in a very sophisticated way. He's doing it with dignity. He's doing it without reading on written signs. But when you have a contention over a simple request to adjourn the sitting to allow a member who has to deliver a tribute at the funeral of a former member of the house and you descend the house into indignity over this question this is the funeral of somebody who has died it was it was deacon mitchell the honorable deacon mitchell who stood and said look i'm, I'm uncomfortable with this back and forth over this question let us take the adjournment and let us put something in place again he rescued the speaker from himself i want to take a break so, here right now and when we come back quickly i just want to touch quickly and we won't have much time just quickly on uh, the uh talking about rules change of rules within the new national party as it relates to selecting candidates for the position of political party at uh, the nnp's convention coming up uh, later on this year a date finally announced this is a narrative i'm on with the chester humphrey former speaker of the, the president, sorry, former president of the Senate of Grenada. More when we come back.